This is the second attempt for a video uh, which will explain the uh, Park Sigjin that uh, will be built at the upcoming Build-a-thon. The first video I made I used a, a crappy camera which uh, didn't do a very good job but what I'll do in this video I'll just go over uh, some of the features, uh, uh, just go over hardware overview and some of the software features for the Sigjin and uh, this won't be the board that's actually going to be built at the Build-a-thon but it's the very first prototype uh, that I made to develop the software on. The original design for the Sigjin came from a very early Sigjin that I made based on SI5351 and uh, this build had some pretty significant limitations. I think the biggest was the fact that I used a two-line um, LCD display. It really limited what uh, could be done. And uh, so in the next uh, generation of this, which is the Park uh, uh, Sigjen, we're using a four-line LCD. And one of the biggest drawbacks for this was not having the ability to display multiple frequencies on the clock output. So having each uh, clock output having a, a different frequency coming out. With this I could only put out a single frequency and a single clock uh, output. So with a with a four line LCD I'm able to do a little bit more. So I'd like to go over some of the hardware features for the uh, Park uh, Sigjen. Uh, first and I guess biggest uh, improvement over the original uh, Sigjen is the use of a four line LCD which is connected using I squared C and uh, this LCD has a I squared C backpack on the back of it which allows it to connect easier to the Arduino Nano which is at, at the heart of the Sigjen only four lines, actually two uh, lines are needed from uh, the the Arduino. There's four lines but two of which are Arduino pins and the other two are, are uh, plus and uh, ground. The other thing is the SI5351. So the Nano is, controls that and there are three clock outputs, clock 0, clock 1 and clock 2 and each of which uh, has the ability for putting out a separate frequency. The board itself has a voltage regulator where we can connect in power from an external source. It can also be powered from the um, USB port. There is a, a rotary encoder there and two push buttons. So the way it works is the rotary encoder allows you to select uh, options. So you could select a menu option, you could change the frequency, the push button on the rotary encoder just like with uh, most other builds allows you to change which digit you're changing in terms of the frequency or if you do a long press it'll reset the, in the entire system. There are two buttons, two uh, push buttons. One push button, uh, think of it as the execute or next button and then the other push button is like a previous or back so this one moves you forward in whatever option you're executing and this one takes you back so eventually you could keep pressing the back button and it takes you back to the menu the rotary encoder and the push buttons have actually some uh, components here which is doing hardware debouncing of the signals and uh, I found that's really necessary uh, because it makes the operation a lot smoother as opposed to doing it in software in the Arduino. Uh, that cleans up the signals coming from these uh, uh, buttons and uh, it's a lot smoother operation. So if we take a look at the way the software operates, the user interface is uh, we've got the 4 line by 20 LCD 
and the way this is broken up there's three I guess sub windows if you think think about it uh, the first is the bottom the fourth line here that displays the menu option this first line here see the 0 1 2 that's where you select your clock and then this part here is where you select frequencies and that's basically the layout for any uh, for the majority of the menu options that you have and I'll just quickly go through each menu option and give a brief introduction of what the menu option is so the very first menu option is called VFO enable and in this mode you can generate any clock signal you want out of uh, each of the clock um, outputs of the SI5351. So by uh, executing this, if you hit the next button, you would go and you'd be able to select the clock. If you hit the next button again, you would be able to go and change the frequency associated with that clock. If you hit the next button, you'll be able to turn on and off the clock. So in this here it's showing you that you're in VFO mode and all clocks are off. If you hit the back button you will go back to the clock selection uh, window where you could select a, another clock and if you hit the previous button again you'll come back to the uh, menu win window. And let me just demonstrate that. So I'm going to push the next button. See in the cursor here is blinking and it jumps up to the window, to the clock selection window. If I was to turn the rotary encoder, you'll see I'm able to change clocks. Now the interesting thing is that um, as you turn it you'll see that if, you, if I'm at 2 and I click forward, I go back to zero. It's wrapping around. See if I'm at two and I go, I rotate the uh, encoder the other way, I'll go back to one, go back to zero, and if I go backwards again, I'll go to two. So it's, it's actually wrapping around. So if I hit the previous button, it takes me back to the menu line where I can now change the menu. And if I was to use the rotary encoder here, I can change what option, what menu option I need. So if I hit the next again, see I'm at uh, clock zero. So if I hit the next button again, it takes me into the frequency update window, turns the clock on, and from here if I turn the rotary encoder, I can change the frequency. If I push the rotary encoder button, you can see I'm, I'm going to a digit which I can go and change. So right there I'm changing the tens of hertz, hundreds, thousands, etc. And it just wraps around. And if I hit the previous button, it takes me back to the clock window the clock selection window, the clock is still on and if I turn my rotary encoder I can select a different clock and if I hit the next button it turns that clock on and now I can change the frequency of that clock and if I hit the next button turns it off, I click the next button turns it on and I can just turn the clock on or off if I hit the previous button, it takes me back out to select the clock. And as I said, if you press and hold the rotary encoder button down, it resets it. And you'll notice when the system comes up from a reset or it powers on, it displays the version of code. Comes up pretty fast, but you'll see this is A0.1C. That's the version of code I'm demonstrating here. That's the version of code you, at this point in time, you should load. 
unless there's some bugs or some something that I have to change and uh, there might be a subsequent release. The next menu option is called LO Enable for Local Oscillator Enable and what that allows you to do is that you can apply offsets to these uh, frequencies so what gets displayed is not the actual frequency that's being put out by the SI5351 but it's uh, for, for example the frequency that's being put out from a mixer after it's mixed with uh, the LO. To explain what I mean by this let's assume that you've got a mixer and you've got some IF frequency coming in into the mixer and you've got a local oscillator which you're going to mix with the IF and you're going to generate some RF coming out and the RF is going to be either the LO plus the IF or the LO minus the the IF. So suppose you wanted to, to the SIGGEN to display what this frequency is coming out. So it's going to do the calculation in the background of the LO frequency plus or minus the IF frequency and it's going to display this frequency that's coming out. So it's basically that IF frequency and I call that the offset. So in the SIGGEN you have to set up an offset for each of the clocks, for clock 0, 1 or 2 and in uh, LO enable mode it's going to apply that offset to to the LO and it's going to display the resulting calculation in the LCD. In order to use the LO enable mode you first have to go and define some offsets and you would do that by taking the rotary encoder and moving to the menu option that says set offset and just as uh, before you press the next button and it takes you into the window which allows you to, to set the offsets if you press the previous button it takes you back to the menu window to the menu line and if you hit the next button it takes you back. The one I guess uh, uh, feature if, of this is that you can't use the rotary encoder to change between the offsets because um, the rotary encoder is allowing you to change the offset itself so you have to hit the next button. So if you hit the next button it takes you to the next line so forth when you're at 2 you hit the next button it takes it wraps around and takes you back to zero. So right now I've got it set so I've got an offset for clock 2 set for 4913007. So what the uh, SIGGEN will, will do is whatever LO frequency that's coming out of the SI5351 on clock 2 it's going to add that to that frequency and display that on the screen. Now let's go back to the LO menu option. Okay, you can see it's still displaying the off the offset because I haven't executed another command. So once I execute the LO enable, so I press the next button, you can see now it's telling me that these two are still in VFO mode because I didn't have an offset set but I do have an offset set for uh, clock 2 and it's just displaying what that frequency um, the LO plus the offset it's displaying what that is so I can go ahead just as with uh, the VFO mode if I press the next button I could turn on that clock if I press the next button again turns it off if I press the previous button takes me back and if I use the rotary encoder I could change which clock I'm going to set. So right there I've just enabled clock 2 disable it and if I hit the previous button comes back. The next menu option available is the IQ enable uh, mode and basically what that's going to do if I execute that, it's only going to allow me to use clock 0 and 2. Clock 1 
is never used. And what it does, it takes whatever frequency that's programmed for clock 0 or 2, it's going to put those two frequencies in quadrature. So clock 2 will be 90 degrees out of phase with clock 1. And uh, typically that's used for if you're doing uh, any kind of an SDR uh, type uh, radio. So let's go ahead and press the next button. And uh, notice the frequency changes. That's the default frequency for I and Q. And notice it sets it all to be the same frequency and it turns on clock 0 and clock 2. So if I was to go and scope those two clocks, you would see that clock 2 is 90 degrees out of phase with uh, clock uh, 2. Or, or clock 2 is 90 degrees out of phase with clock 0. And again, you could use the rotary encoder to change the frequency. Now notice, when you change the frequency, it changes both clock 0 and clock 2 together because it's pointless having a quadrature output with clock 0 and 2 with different frequencies. And again, if you push the rotary encoder, you can change which digit you want. If you press the next button, you drop down. Uh, I didn't bother uh, uh, implementing this to come out to the clock window. Instead, uh, you just hit the next button and it ping-pongs between clock 2 and clock a zero. And if you hit the previous button, it takes you back to the uh, menu line where you could change the menu. There's also a calibrate menu function which allows you to calibrate the SI5351. So if I was to go ahead and execute calibrate, whatever frequencies are displayed here, those are the frequencies it's going to spit out of the SI5351 and uh, you would put a, a, a counter to measure that frequency, the accuracy of that uh, frequency and then you could put a correction factor, a plus or minus number which allows you to uh, correct that frequency out. So let's go ahead and execute to calibrate. You'll see automatically as soon as I execute I press the next button it comes up and it gives me a little number here I could come and change a three digit number and it turns all the clocks on and whatever frequency I've got uh, uh, pre-selected it's gonna put those frequencies out of the clock so for example if you wanted to go and uh, calibrate to 10 megahertz or 5 megahertz you'd have to go into VFO mode and set that clock for that frequency and then measure it. In this menu option you can't go and change uh, the frequency. And here you could take the rotary encoder and you can tune it and you could change the numbers. You can push the rotary encoder to change the digit. And if you press the next button that value is saved and if you hit the previous button it ignores that value so let's go ahead and save that it comes back and gives you the OK and then it automatically turns off the clocks for, for you and that value is saved. The next two menu options uh, save and recall allows you to uh, save um, frequencies and uh, configuration information into the Arduino's flash memory or you can recall it. The way I've got this configured is that there are three memory look four memory locations available that you can store information to. And basically in each memory location you can save your calibration information, you can save offsets for the, the LO mode, you can save VFO frequencies, or you can save I and Q frequencies. The way the memory locations are uh, defined is that memory location 0, uh, that's used for power on default. So, so whenever you reset 
the SIGGEN or you power it on, whatever values get saved in location zero, that's what get, um, gets used. Then you have three locations, location one, two, and three, which the user can go and store whatever values they want in. But uh, zero is special. That's you only save values for zero that you want for your power on default. The way the save option works is that you would press the next button once you've selected save and uh, it comes up and it shows you comes up and it gives you a number which is the memory location so right there it's showing you memory location one and if you want you could change that to memory location zero right up to memory location three so for example if we wanted to save the currently defined VFO frequencies, the calibration information, the LO offsets and the I and Q frequencies that were defined, we would go ahead and press the next button. If you wanted to cancel, you would press the previous button and it doesn't save it. So let's go ahead and save this. It says OK. The next menu option available is the recall menu option. It's basically exactly the same as the save except it's going to recall a memory location and uh, use that to define the VFO frequencies, the LO offsets, uh, the I and Q uh, frequencies and the calibration data. So if I was to go ahead and press the next button, execute that menu option, it comes up and it gives me a, a number, the memory location which I can recall. So if I wanted to recall memory location 2 for example, I would press the next button and it comes back and says OK. It was able to recall it and you'll see the window changed. So in my memory location 2 I had some different frequencies defined and so that changed. If you went and you tried to recall a location which there was no data in, you have not saved any inf information, it would recognize this and you'd get a mem error message here. It would come back and say mem error and what that means is that there's nothing defined at that memory location. The next menu option is the CLI enable uh, option and basically what that's doing that's going to allow you to connect a TTY terminal, a serial terminal to the Arduino and you would be able to go in and uh, use a command line to change frequencies and set IQ frequencies and so forth. Basically you would do almost everything you could do from the LCD but you're doing it from a command line. So if I was to go and execute this you would see the screen changes and I can't do anything to the screen so it's now turned control over to the CLI. So I would have to connect up to the CLI uh, using like a PC and from there I'd be able to type in commands if you wanted to return back to the LCD you could do that two ways from the CLI you can issue a reset command to reset the system or if you do a long press on the rotary encoder you would reset the system and the LCD comes back the last menu option is the reset function and basically that does the exact same thing that if you press and hold the rotary encoder down does it just basically resets the system so if I was to press the next button it just resets the system what I'd like to do now is go over some of the limitations of the uh, SIGGEN and uh, these, these limitations arise uh, from 
uh, limitations associated with the SI5351. The SI5351 has two PLLs, PLLA and B, however it's got three clock outputs. So this means that two of the three clock outputs have to share one PLL and a third clock output can have its own dedicated PLL. Currently I've got it configured so clock 0 and clock 2 share the same PLL and clock 1 has its own dedicated PLL. Clock 1 uses PLLB, clock 0 and 2 uses PLLA. Right now clock 0 and 2 can only go between 8 kilohertz to 114 megahertz. Clock 1 can go all the way from 1.5 kilohertz all the way to uh, 225 megahertz. That limitation between clock 0 and 2 arises due to the fact that to go below 8,000 uh, kilohertz or 8 kilohertz and go above 114 megahertz I have to configure the PLL in a specific way to get those frequencies and if I was to do that with uh, clock 0 or clock 2 it would impact the, uh, the frequency of the other clock so I can't do any special configuration of the PLL so therefore I'm limited in the range of frequencies I can use. The next limitation has to do with the quadrature output of the SI5351. Currently um, the SIGGEN only supports uh, frequencies between 3 MHz and 80 MHz. Any frequency below 3 MHz you're not, it, it can't be put into quadrature and uh, uh, frequencies above uh, 80 or even close to, uh, to 80 megahertz it's not really in quadrature you'll find that you only can get quadrature up to maybe 40 or 50 megahertz and after that quadrature starts slipping so the limitation here that's hard coded is that you can only go down to a frequency of 3 of 3 megahertz and the maximum frequency you could go up to is uh, 80 megahertz. So that concludes my in introduction to the PARC uh, SIGGEN and some of the features and functionality available within the SIGGEN.